Greetings, I am Nitish Mukhopadhyay, Professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores. Welcome to the series, The Films of Distinguished Statisticians. This is a joint program of Pfizer Global Research and Development, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores, and the American Statistical Association. The funding helps us to invite the most distinguished statistical scientists to our university. It also allows us to film the Pfizer colloquia and conversations for the archive of the American Statistical Association. Before we begin the 22nd colloquium in this series, with deep gratitude, let me mention two colleagues, late Professor Harry Poston and Dr. David Salzberg. Late Professor Poston and Dr. Salzberg had engineered this program more than 33 years ago. The first film in this series was launched in 1978. I feel proud to introduce this 22nd Pfizer Colloquium in honor of Dr. Salzberg. The colloquia will be presented by Professor Steve Feinberg. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Myron Straff, Deputy Director, Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education at the National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C. He will introduce our distinguished presenter, Dr. Steve Feinberg. Myron. Thank you, Nitas. It is an honor to introduce Professor Steven Feinberg, our speaker today, for the 22nd Pfizer Colloquium in Statistics, part of a series of colloquia by distinguished statisticians in honor of Dr. David Salzberg. And we're grateful for the support provided by Pfizer Global Research here in Connecticut, the American Statistical Association, and the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut. Professor Feinberg is the Maurice Falk University Professor of Statistics and Social Science at Carnegie Mellon University, with joint appointments in departments and centers for machine learning, information systems, and computer and communication security, among others. Professor Feinberg is renowned for his many contributions to statistical methods that have had a profound impact. For example, his work has vastly expanded the use of log linear models, leading to discoveries in many scientific fields, improved the design of survey questionnaires across the federal statistical system, improved estimates of the numbers of those missed in the census count, and in particular for those in minority groups who are missed at higher rates. And he developed methods to limit identity disclosure in order to allow researchers to analyze government data that would not otherwise be available because of requirements to keep the identity of individuals confidential. For his path-breaking research, he has received many awards and honors, including his election to the Royal Society of Canada, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences, the most distinguished honor that one can receive from peers across all communities of science. The vast array of different areas of application to which he has contributed is indeed incredible. Just at the National Academy of Sciences alone, he has served on committees leading to Academy's reports on many varied topics such as rehabilitating criminals, disability, race and ethnicity, discrimination, radiation epidemiology, public confidence in elections, vaccine safety, 
effects of secondhand tobacco smoke, protecting privacy in combating terrorism, and the use of social science research as evidence in public policy. He has chaired Academy's committees on sharing research data, statistical evidence in the courts, evaluation studies of bilingual education, and the scientific evidence on the polygraph. Most notable was his service as chair of the Committee on National Statistics. Under his leadership, the committee became a widely respected and influential institution of the federal statistical system. Today, Professor Feinberg serves as co-chair of the Academy's Report Review Committee, the most important committee in the Academy, which oversees every report in every field, over 200 reports each year. His other contributions to the discipline and profession of statistics are also renowned through many books and papers, service on countless professional committees, and as an editor for many journals, and his testimony before Congress. He co-founded Chance Magazine and the Journal of Privacy and Confidentiality. But even more than his qualities as a statistician are his qualities as a person. His style and clarity of expression as you will see, enable others to learn. But his caring about their learning has left a vast legacy with his colleagues, students, and friends. He has been especially close to his students, fostering them personally as well as professionally. For all the times that the spotlight has been on him, he willingly steps aside to let others into that light in order for them to learn and to advance professionally. For statistics, in a word, Steve Feinberg is a hero. He has advanced our discipline and brought statistics to bear on some of the toughest issues facing society. He not only has provided a greater understanding of those issues, but in doing so, he has underscored the importance of statistics in service to science, technology, and society. How befitting it is that he addresses us today on statistics in service to the nation. I give you now Professor Stephen E. Feinberg. I'm honored to present the 22nd Pfizer Colloquium in the series of colloquia by distinguished statisticians in honor of David Salzberg. David and I share a passion for many things in statistics but especially for the history of statistics. This is a special honor for me in another sense, since participating in the associated ASA Distinguished Lecture Series includes me in the company of my first statistics teacher, Don Fraser from the University of Toronto, and my PhD advisor and mentor the late Fred Mosteller from Harvard University. Both were officially PhD students of John Tukey at Princeton, and John also has appeared in this series. Who first implemented large-scale hierarchical Bayesian models? When and why? I suspect that the answer will surprise you. It was none other than John Tukey in 1962 with David Wallace and David Brillinger as part of the NBC election night team. What I'm referring to is their statistical model for predicting election results based on early returns. The methods an election night forecasting model were indeed novel at the time, and they're now recognizable as hierarchical Bayesian methods with the use of empirical Bayes techniques at the top level. The specific version of hierarchical Bayes in the election night model remains unpublished to this day, but Tukey students and his collaborators began to use related ideas 
under the label borrowing strength. And all of this happened before the methodology was described in somewhat different form by I.J. Good in his 1965 monograph and christened as hierarchical bays in the classic 1970 paper by Dennis Lindley and Adrian Smith. I was privileged to be part of that team in 1976 and 1978. And there were close to 20 PhD statisticians involved in one form or another, mainly working in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, at the RCA lab, which housed a large mainframe computer dedicated to the evening's activities and a backup, because when one of the large mainframes failed, it simply didn't get rebooted and running again in a matter of seconds or minutes, the way our machines are today. There were also a few statisticians in New York interacting with the NBC decision desk. Those were the people that you saw on television. Each analyst had a computer terminal and an assignment of states and political races. A summary of each run of the model for a given race could easily be read from the terminal console, but the full output with all of the details broken down county by county within state went to a nearby line printer and was almost immediately available for direct examination as a runner delivered them to each of the analysts. Analysts worked with the model, often trying different prior distributions. And these were linked to different past elections that were chosen as models for the ones for which we, we were creating forecasts. Checking on the robustness of conclusions to varying specifications was a key part of the task. All too often, academic statisticians think of their role as the production of new theory and new methods. Our motivation comes in large part from the theoretical and methodological work of others. Our careers are built and judged, built on and judged by our publications in prestigious journals, such as the Annals of Statistics, Biometrica, and the Journal of the American Statistical Association. These are now joined by the new Annals of Applied Statistics. And we often build our careers around such research and publishing activities. Today, I want to focus on a different role that many statisticians have and should play, and how this role interacts with the traditional role of developing new methods and publishing in quality statistical journals. This is the role we can fulfill in support of national activities and projects requiring statistical insight and statistical rigor. Much of the story, and it is a story, is autobiographical, largely because I know best the things that have motivated my own efforts and my own research. Further, I interpret the, word for the, the words for the nation in my title quite liberally, so that they include election night forecasts and other public uses of statistical ideas and methods. In exploring this theme with you, I will be paying homage to two of the most important influences 
on my view of statistics, Frederick Mosteller and William Kruskal. I've been privileged to serve as one of the editors of Mosteller's autobiography, not published during his lifetime, but due to appear in early 2010. One of the remarkable features of this volume is that it doesn't begin with Fred's early life. Instead, the volume begins by providing chapter-length treatments that are insider accounts of Fred's work on six collaborative interdisciplinary projects. Evaluating the pre-election poll of 1948, statistical aspects of the Kinsey report on sexual behavior in the human male, mathematical learning theory, the authorship of the disputed Federalist Papers, the safety of anesthetics, and a wide-ranging examination of the Coleman report on the equality of educational opportunity. With the exception of mathematical learning theory, all of these deal with important and typically substantial applications, applications where new theory and methodology or serious adaptations of standard statistical thinking were important. Fred Mosteller not only worked on such applications, but he also thought it important to carry the methodological ideas back from them into the mainstream statistical literature. One of the key themes I want to emphasize today is the importance of practical motivation for statistical theory and methods and the iteration between application and theory. Further, I want to encourage those of you in the audience, especially the students and junior faculty, to get engaged in the kinds of problems I'll describe, both because I'm sure you'll find them interesting and as exciting as I do, but also because they may lead to your own professional development and advancement. Let me take as my point of departure the National Halothane Study. This was an investigation carried out under the auspices of the National Research Council. Unlike most NRC studies, it involved data collection and data analysis including data analysis based on new methodology. The controversy about the safety of the anesthetic halothane was the result of a series of published cases involving deaths following the use of halothane in surgery. Fred, in his autobiography, offers the following example. A healthy young woman accidentally slashed her wrists on a broken window pane and was rushed to the hospital. Surgery was performed using the anesthetic halothane with results that led everyone to believe that the outcome of the treatment was satisfactory. But a few days later, the patient died. The cause was traced to massive hepatic necrosis. So many of her liver cells died that life could not be sustained. Such outcomes are very rare, but especially in healthy young people. The NRC Halothane Committee collected data from 50,000 hospital records. These were arrayed in the form 
of a very large, sparse, multi-way contingency table. There were 34 hospitals, five anesthetics, five years, two genders, five age groups, seven risk levels. There was type of operation. And of course, survival, whether or not the patient survived or died. In the time period in an array of hospitals, there were approximately 17,000 deaths and a sample of 25 cases per hospital used to estimate the denominator, these making up the residual 33,000 cases. Now, when I say sparse, I mean we're talking about cells in a contingency table with an average count less than one. The common wisdom of the day back in the 1960s was that to analyze contingency tables, one needed a minimum cell count of five. And zeros, in particular, were an anathema. You may even have read such advice in recent papers and books, or seen them in your classroom. The many statisticians involved in the Halothane study brought a number of standard and new statistical ideas to bear on this problem. I'll talk about one of these, the use of log linear models, that was worked on largely by Yvonne Bishop, who was a graduate student at the time in the Department of Statistics at Harvard. The primary theory she relied upon was at that time, a somewhat obscure paper by an Englishman named Birch, whose theorem on the existence of maximum likelihood estimates assumed that all cell counts are positive. If you stop for a second and think about sparse tables and an average count less than one, clearly large numbers of cells contain zeros. And so the Halothane study posed a challenge for existing theory. In addition, Yvonne needed a way to do the calculations associated with the computation of maximum likelihood estimates. And this was at a time when we were still carrying boxes of punch cards to the computer center to run batch programs. The simple version of the story was that Yvonne used Birch's results, ignoring the condition on positive cell counts, to derive connections between log linear and logit models, and to compute maximum likelihood estimates using a version of the method of iterative proportional fitting developed by Deming and Stefan in 1940 for a different but related problem. She applied this new methodology to the Halothane study data. Because the tables of interest from the study exceeded the capacity of the largest available computers of the day, she was led to explore ways to simplify the IPF calculations through the use of multiplicative adjustments to the estimates for marginal tables, an idea related to models with what we called direct multiplicative estimates and involving ideas from conditional independence and graphical models as we know them today. The amazing thing was that the ideas actually worked and that the results were a crucial part of the 1969 published committee report. They also form the heart of Avon's PhD thesis. Now, let me step back just a couple of years to the summer of 1966, 
when Fred suggested a pair of different research problems to me involving contingency tables, one of which involved Bayesian smoothing. The smoothing problem utilized the idea of hierarchical models and thus linked in ways I didn't understand at the time to the election night forecasting model from NBC that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Both of the problems Fred introduced me to were motivated by difficulties he encountered in his work with other statisticians on the Halothane study. They ended up in my 1968 PhD thesis. It was only later that I began to think hard about Yvonne's problem of zeros and maximum likelihood estimation. This work involves several of the students I worked with, most notably Shelby Haberman at the University of Chicago and Mike Meyer at the University of Minnesota. Today, the computer programs for log linear model methods are rooted in the code originally developed by Yvonne for the Halothane study and Shelby Haberman more uh, recently. And the theoretical question of when zeros matter and when they do not for log linear models was finally resolved by my Carnegie Mellon student and now junior colleague, Alessandro Rinaldo. The log linear model work took on a life of its own, at least for me, and it culminated in the book with Yvonne and Paul Holland, Discrete Multivariate Analysis, Theory and Practice that we published in 1975. Others refer to this book as the Jolly Green Giant because of the original cover. And that book included many new applications involving extensions of the contingency table ideas. I'd like to talk about one of these, but only after introducing some additional chronological touch points. In 1970, when I was a junior faculty member at the University of Chicago, my senior colleague Bill Kruskal seemed to be headed to Washington with enormous frequency. After a while, I learned about his service as a member of the President's Commission on Federal Statistics led by W. Allen Wallace, then president of the University of Rochester, and co-chaired by Fred Mosteller. When the commission reported in 1971, it included many topics that provided a crosswalk between the academic statistics community and statisticians in the federal government. One topic explored at length in the report was privacy and confidentiality, and I'll return to this shortly. The release of the report of the President's Commission was a defining moment not only for the federal statistical system, but also for the National Academies of Science. The two-volume report had many recommendations to improve aspects of the system and its coordination. But for the moment, I want to focus on the emphasis in the report on the need for outside advice and assessment of the work going on in the federal government and read to you recommendation 5-4. The commission recommends that a National Academy of Science National Research Council Committee be established to provide an outside review of federal statistical activities. That committee was indeed established a few years later 
as the Committee on National Statistics, which I'll refer to as CNSTAT. And it has blossomed to fulfill not only the role envisioned by Commission members, but also to serve as a repository for statistical knowledge, both about the federal statistical system and also statistical methodology for the NRC more broadly. The agenda was well set by the committee's first chair, William Kreskel, who insisted that its focus be national statistics and not simply federal statistics, implying that its mandate reaches well beyond the usual topics and problems associated with the federal statistical agencies and their data series. I joined the committee in 1978 and served as chair from 1981 through 1987. It has served as the backdrop for many of the other topics I plan to cover today. One of the most vexing public controversies that has raged for the better part of the last 40 years has been the accuracy of the decennial census. As early as 1950, the Census Bureau began carrying out what it called a post-enumeration survey to gauge the accuracy of the count. NRC committees in 1969 and again in 1979 addressed the topic of census accuracy and the possibility that census counts be adjusted for differential undercount of blacks. Following the 1980 census, New York City sued the Bureau demanding that it use a pair of surveys conducted at census time to carry out an adjustment. The proposed adjustment methodology used a Bayesian version of something known as dual system estimation, or capture-recapture methodology. For those who've read Bishop Feinberg and Holland, you will know that this is a special case of log linear model methodology. In the 1980s, and again in the 1990s, I was a member of the Com a Committee on National Statistics panel addressing this and other methodological issues. Several authors during this period wrote about multiple system estimation in this census context, and I was one of these. Most of this discussion used, in some form or another, the results from what I recall is Chapter 7 of Bishop Feinberg and Holland. And if you stop for a minute and envision a list as including names or not including names, and you have K-lists, then the data for the people that are counted can be arrayed in a 2 to the K contingency table. And the big problem is that we don't get to observe anybody in the cell corresponding to being missed by all K-lists. So the approach to this problem is to fit a model to the incomplete 2 to the k table and then project the results of that model to the missing cell. Political pressures and lawsuits that carried the issue to the Supreme Court of the U.S. have thwarted the use of this methodology as a formal part of the census. And much of the story is chronicled in my 1999 book with Margot Anderson, Who Counts? 
but the work has gone on. In conjunction with the 2000 census, Bureau statisticians use related log linear methodology to produce alternative population estimates from a collection of administrative lists. This work appears to be reviving for the 2010 census that will take place in the coming year. And in the meantime, I and others have produced several variants on the multiple recapture methodology to deal with population heterogeneity. I'm especially proud of the fact that the same tools of using multiple lists to estimate the size of a population have now emerged as major methodologies in epidemiology, especially through the 1990s, and in human rights over the past decade to estimate the number of casualties in civil conflicts. This is an amazing and unexpected consequence of work begun in a totally different form as part of the National Halothane study and coming out of the methodology that it spawned. One of the things that one learns about real sample surveys is that the measurement problems, especially those associated with questionnaire design, are immense. I learned this firsthand while working with data from the National Crime Survey in the 1970s and as part of a redesign team in the 1980s. And also as an advisor to the National Commission on Employment and Unemployment Statistics in the late 1970s. These matters rarely, if ever, show up in the statistical classroom or in statistical textbooks. And they've long been viewed as a matter of art rather than science. Triggered by a 1980 very small workshop on victimization measurement and cognitive psychology, I proposed that the Committee on National Statistics sponsor a workshop on cognitive aspects of survey measurement that would bring together survey specialists, government statisticians, methodologically oriented statisticians, and cognitive scientists. My motivation was simple. The creative use of statistical thinking could suggest new ways of carrying out interviews. And these new ways could ultimately improve not only specific surveys, but the field as a whole. Under the leadership of Judy Tanner and Myron Straff, Synstat hosted such a workshop in the summer of 1983, and it produced a wide array of, at the time, unorthodox ideas that have now been instantiated in three major U.S. statistics agencies and their cognitive laboratories, and are part of the training of virtually every survey statistician. Census Bureau surveys and census forms, including the ones that you will all complete in the coming decennial census in 2010, are now regularly developed using cognitive principles. Today, Few students or practitioners of survey sampling understand the methodological roots of this enterprise. I mentioned that the President's Commission explored the topic of privacy and confidentiality in depth in its report. There were actually two full chapters. 
But what I failed to tell you was that most of this discussion was about legal and other protections for statistical databases. Indeed, as I participated in discussions of large government surveys throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the topic was always presented as part of the discussion, but rarely in a form that you and I would recognize as statistical. I recall a conversation over lunch one day with Morris Hansen, who had been intimately involved in rules developed at the Census Bureau to deal with the matter. And I asked Morris, where did the census rules come from? And he explained that they needed to have some rule to protect confidentiality associated with Title 13 of the U.S. Code and the release of a coming census. And so they got together over lunch, and they decided that they could release data for population groups or cities of magnitude a million or more. And that worked for that census. And it didn't seem to produce any confidentiality problems and so they got together again somewhat later, over lunch yet again, and they decided that they could release data for population groupings of 500,000 or more. No formulas, no theorems, nothing to define what the protection of confidentiality truly meant. That began to change in the mid-1980s with the work of my then colleagues, George Duncan and Diane Lambert in the Department of Statistics at Carnegie Mellon. Their work interpreted several rules for protection of confidentiality that were in government use in the context of the formalism of statistical decision theory. I was finally drawn into this area when I was asked to review the statistical literature on the topic for a conference in Dublin in 1992. I discovered what I like to refer to as a statistical gold mine whose veins I have been working for the past 17 years. There has been a major change in the world since the President's Commission's report. And that change is linked to changes in the world of computing and the growth of the World Wide Web. The changes in computing and the web have produced new demands for access to statistical data. People expect to be able to go to a web page, click on an icon, and suddenly have on their own machine access to the full survey records of thousands of individuals. And the same technology has created new dangers for inappropriate record linkage and statistical disclosures. These aren't simply national American issues. The World Wide Web knows no boundaries. And so they are international ones, and they have stimulated exciting technical statistical research that one sees in countries around the world. How does this work link to other topics I've discussed today? Well, much of my own research has dealt with the protection of information in large, sparse contingency tables. And it will not surprise you to learn 
that it ties to the theory of log-linear models. In fact, there are also deep ties and links to the algebraic geometry literature, and in particular to the geometry of the 2 by 2 contingency table. One of those problems that Fred Mosteller introduced me to linked his work with John Gilbert on the National Halothane Study in 1966. And it is that very geometry that is depicted by the artist on the cover of the Jolly Green Giant Discrete Multivariate Analysis. At the University of Chicago, Hans Eisel introduced me to problems involving statistics and the law, both of a civil and a criminal nature. I guess the tutoring stuck since I've been dabbling in such matters ever since. This has included articles in law journals, statistical journals, and in periodic engagements as an expert witness in actual cases. My father was always quite proud of this since he was trained as a lawyer and I think harbored a desire for a long time that I would follow in his footsteps. In the mid-1980s, since that organized a panel to look at the ways statistics was actually used as evidence in such settings. I chaired that panel, and its 1989 report is still in print. There is now a triennial interdisciplinary International Conference on Forensic Statistics. And that conference includes discussion of the role of DNA evidence, discrimination litigation, and other forms of forensic evidence such as tool marks, fingerprinting, and ear prints, as well as more cerebral topics such as the theory of evidence. In 2000, I was asked to chair yet another NRC activity, a committee on the accuracy of polygraph evidence. This was in the aftermath of the Wen Ho Lee affair at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and this study was in response to a congressional request. My principal qualification for the job, beyond my broad statistical background in research and writing on forensic topics, was ignorance. I had never read such a study on the polygraph, nor had I ever been subjected to a polygraph exam. This committee and the activities surrounding the preparation of its report turned out to be another one of those interdisciplinary experiences. And I'll share with you just one figure from the committee's report. This takes the form of a receiver operating characteristic, or ROC plot. This is just a scatter plot, and it's showing the sensitivity and specificity figures derived from each of the 52 laboratory studies that met the committee's minimal quality criteria. I like to refer to this as our show me the data plot, because it contains all of the core data we were able to extract from the 52 studies. Each study in the plot has its own ROC curve. The points are connected by dotted lines. To get the full curve, you actually have to take the dotted lines and extend to the corners of the plot. 
you can clearly see from the plot why we concluded that the polygraph is better than chance but far from perfect. The 45 degree line on the plot corresponds to chance. That is, what would happen if instead of actually reading the outcome of the polygraph exam, one simply flimp coins. And the upper corner corresponds to a perfect polygraph. And we see no studies that are exactly in the corner. Further, on the plot, you'll see two smooth curves. And these represent the accuracy scores encompassed by something like the interquartile range of the experimental results. Now, those of you in the audience who recall that there does not exist a unique natural definition of quartiles for a multivariate data of this nature, you need to understand what the committee did. So first we computed the area under the curve for each study. So connect the studies to the two corners and actually compute the area. And then what we did is we took the 52 values of area and we rank ordered them. And we then chose the 25th and 75th percentiles of this area value. And we converted those percentile values into symmetric ROC curves. And these are the two that are plotted on the graph. These curves also happen to enclose approximately 50% of the data points. Uh, that was fortuitous and is not captured by any theorem I know of. The committee chose this scatter plot, which, as I said, includes essentially all the relevant data on accuracy from the studies we examined rather than giving a single number, or that single number with added standard error bounds, something we talk about as statisticians. And we did so largely because we judged it important to make the full variability of results across the different studies visible, and because of our own internal analysis of the characteristics of the study left us suspicious that that variability was non-random. Polygraph accuracy likely depends on unknown specifics of the test situation, and we didn't want to create the impression that there's a single number that can be appropriately used to describe polygraph accuracy across situations. The committee was concerned that if it provided any such number, some would too easily misconstrue that as our consensus finding about polygraph accuracy. This reluctance to use a summary number was enhanced by our recognition that claims about polygraph accuracy are most commonly expressed in terms of percent correct results. And I should add, incorrectly reporting exactly what that number is. The usual accuracy in index from an ROC curve gives a value of 50% for a test that performs at chance levels. That's that 45 degree line. And the committee didn't want to leave the serious misimpression that the polygraph, which performs better than chance, could therefore catch most of the spies who take it. Although I thought this was going to be a one-of-a-kind activity, I guess I should have known better. About a year after the release of the report, I testified at a Senate hearing on the Department of Energy's polygraph policy. 
And then I followed up on another NRC committee linking some of the same ideas on the detection of deception to privacy and counterterrorism. And I continue to be called upon by the media to comment on the accuracy of such methods used in new contexts such as security screening in airports as recently as this past month, almost seven years after the publication of our report. There are a number of other NRC studies in this broad area. I can mention a pair of studies on DNA forensic evidence, the first of which was quite controversial. A related 2005 symposium carried out at the National Academy of Sciences involving others. Two other Committee on National Statistics reports, one on bullet-lead identification and the other on ballistic imaging all calling into question how forensic evidence is gathered and how it's assessed and what uses it can play because of the accuracy or limited accuracy in a legal context. These different efforts culminated in the most recent NRC committee report which called for a new and systematic approach to the assessment of forensic evidence so that in the future we would not be left with the ad hominem forensic science, an oxymoron. Smoking has been implicated in adverse health outcomes going back to the 1964 Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. And it encompassed pioneering statistical contributions by William Cochran and Jerry Cornfield. In the 1980s, attention turned to secondhand smoke and its effect on chronic diseases such as cancer, in particular lung cancer. Most recently, we've seen a progressive series of smoking bans, especially beginning in airlines and then moving to other public places. Beginning in 2004, there were a series of published studies on the effect of smoking bans on acute coronary events heart attacks. Many felt that there was little or no scientific basis to believe that a very brief exposure to secondhand smoke in a bar or in the workplace could trigger a heart attack. The Center for Disease, Centers for Disease Control commissioned a study at the Institute of Medicine another part of the NRC, to examine this issue. Our committee focused on 11 epidemiological studies on the effect of smoking bans, each of which claimed to show a reduction in heart attacks. These ranged from a 6% reduction to a 47% reduction following the imposition of the ban. The area studied ranged from a small town in Montana, a pair of communities in Colorado, to New York State and Scotland and Italy. All of the studies were flawed, but often in very different ways. Each study did a statistical analysis and a test of significance. Each controlled for background factors in different fashion. You might have expected a statistician on such a committee 
to carry out a meta-analysis. But the other statistician on the committee and I argued against this. Meta-analysis is for comparing apples to apples and sometimes apples to oranges. But we were confronted with apples, oranges, bananas, and kiwis. So instead, we critiqued each study with care, and we asked how they fit together as an ensemble and with the biological data on secondhand smoke and its effects. In the end, we concluded that these studies were consistent with the causal relationship between smoking bans and heart attacks, but we refused, as the committee on the polygraph did, to report a single number. You may have read about our study in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago. My work on combining evidence from diverse sources for policy purposes continues. And I hope to carry back to statistics in a more structured fashion some of the ideas I've shared with you today, as well as carry them into the arena on social science evidence for policy purposes. What are the lessons you might leave this lecture having learned? First, it's fun to be a statistician, especially because we can ply our science in a diverse set of ways, on a diverse collection of applications that actually matter. But perhaps most of you already knew that. Second, big problems, especially those confronting the nation, almost always have a statistical component. And working on these can be rewarding both personally and professionally. Your work can make a difference. Third, even working on small aspects of these large national problems can stimulate the creation of new statistical methodology and theory. Thus, if you engage in those activities, you'll still have a chance to publish in the best journals of our field. Fourth, such new methodology often has unplanned for application in other fields and will let you, as a statistician, cross substantive boundaries in new and exciting ways. Who would have thought that working on a few problems emerging out of the National Halothane Study in the safe harbor of the Department of Statistics at Harvard would lead to new integrated sets of models and methods that would have impact in many fields and in many different forms across an array of applications. John Tukey's obituary that appeared in the New York Times noted, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. I think we can go, John, one better. We can also bring the toys home when we're done and continue to play with them until it's time to take them to a new place. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Steve, thank you. Thank you kindly for a stimulating lecture that will be preserved in the archive of the American Statistical Association. Thank you, Myron, and thank you all.
Thank you.